I've always wanted to be roasted. <laughs> it's probably as close as I'll get. Uh, thanks, Lee, for the introduction. Thanks for taking the time to be here today and for spending all the time that you do uh, with me on the work that I'm doing here at ASU. Uh, I'd like to, before doing anything else, uh, take a moment to acknowledge that we're on Tohono O'odham land and pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'd like to say thank you again to Lee, to Kristen LaRue for helping me uh, put this together, for Kyle Mox, who are with, and thank Kyle Mox, who directs uh, the Fulbright program over at Barrett. Thanks to Bruce uh, for running sound, I guess, for filming me. Um, I need to especially thank my hosts at University of Queensland in Brisbane, Professor David Carter. Thanks also to Jillian Whitlock, Alan Lawson, and Alyssa McCown, who worked with me directly while I was over there and really mentored me uh, on campus and at conferences around the country. And I'd like to say thank you especially to the Ocelot team, uh, starting with director Carrie Kilner, and then Katrina, Joe, Brendan, Jonathan, Saskia, and Jemima, who I worked with every day while I was over there. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a small team, a really dedicated team, and they were my, um, my, the first people who made me feel like I belonged over there. Uh, it's a strange experience for a really small town kid from Texas to find himself living, not just in a major city, but in one in a different country. Uh, and I thought moving to Huntsville was really hard when I was uh, 22 because I didn't know anybody there. Uh, and then I did it again 10 years later in a different country where I didn't know anybody. So uh, thanks to those folks for everything that they taught me and for taking such good care of me. I'm excited to talk about Ostelet. I think it's a wonderful organization. Uh, I think it's wholly unique in what they do in terms of promoting a national literature, archiving a national literature, um, and distributing information about creative works, scholarship, um, and particularly indigenous uh, authorship and creative expression. So they're the premier resource for the study of Australian literature. They've indexed nearly 900,000 works, over 150,000 people, or what they call agents, and organizations, and nearly 30,000 subject tags that you can click on to limit your search results. Oscillet is housed within the University of Queensland in Brisbane, though they collaborate with the National Library of Australia, the Australian Research Council, and universities and organizations throughout the country. They are absolutely unique as an archive of national literature. The closest databases we have here are ProQuest Literature Online and Gale Group's Literature Resource Center. But those databases include English-speaking writers from all over the world. Auslit is solely Australian. There are contributors who are not Australian, uh, but subject matter is all Australian. Uh, Auslit features biographical and bibliographical records for authors, histories of awards and prizes, interviews, links to critical secondary sources, and specially themed exhibitions compiled by experts in the field, and I'll spend the most of my time up here today talking about those. They are also the home for the Association for the Study of Australian Literature, and uh, what I think is probably the most fascinating part is that they're the home for the Black Words Initiative. Uh, which constitutes the largest single archive dedicated to the creative works of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers and storytellers, with over 6,000 authors and more than 23,000 works indexed within that initiative alone. In my time as an intern with Ocelot, I met the founder of Black Words, Dr. Anita Heiss, who you see right there. Uh, she is a scholar, novelist, poet, uh, she's written a memoir called Am I Black Enough For You? She's a television personality. She's one of the most recognizable ambassadors of Australian Aboriginal literatures. I, uh, we hosted a professional uh, development day and she and Carrie spearheaded that. Um, along with Dr. Heiss, I also met at that event Larissa Berent and the poet Sam Wagon Watson. All three of these writers spoke at Auslet's first professional development day for teachers in November 2017. And the exhibition that I worked on while I was there touches on many of the works and themes discussed there, uh, particularly Henry Lawson's famous short story, The Drover's Life, uh, which I'll get into here in just a bit. 
Uh, so what I thought I would do is kind of, since I imagine there aren't a lot of people here uh, necessarily who worked in Australian literatures, I wanted to sort of explain how I came to it, how that led to a Fulbright, and then how working as an intern at Oslip, Oslip was sort of this pivot moment in my research. I looked right into that light and I just did it again. That was a must. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, uh, as Lee mentioned, uh, I don't know, actually he didn't say this, he's my, he's my advisor, my dissertation advisor. Um, but really, I, uh, this project that I'm working on now started because I was doing a directed study with Lee on literatures of the West. I had this bright idea that I was gonna come out here and just do a dissertation on Western novels, I guess. And uh, so we did this directed study together where I was reading all these Western novels and I'm trying to think you know, what, what I can do for a dissertation. And I had this brilliant idea sitting over there in LL and I thought, hey, there's an outback in Australia. They probably have Western novels too. <laughs> and, I, and that was it, that was the whole idea. And I was so fired up. <laughs> and I go running up to Lee's office over in LL. I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? And he's like, yeah, follow, you know, yeah. <laughs> Get out of here, kid. Uh, so I wanted to really, because I'm from Texas, I really wanted to focus on narratives of Texas. My, my master's work, um, and, and some of the stuff I've done here has been about, specifically about indigeneity in my home state, right? Uh, and the, the erasures and removals there, and then how um, Comanche peoples have been fictionalized by settler writers, right? So I, I thought I'll do a comparative project about these novels of Texas with these Westerns of Australia. So being the scholar that I am, I got on Google and I, typed Texas, Australia. <laughs> Literature, I guess, I don't know what I, just Texas, Australia, right? We'll see what comes up, who's doing, who's doing work on it. Uh, and you might be surprised to know that uh, nothing scholarly came up necessarily, but this came up. Uh, and I'm not gonna play the whole thing for you, but I do wanna give you a taste of authentic Australian rural culture because I've heard so many kangaroo jokes leading up to this talk. Uh, in part, I think because of the picture that went out in the email as part of the promo <laughs> material, uh, which I fought against, but here we are. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Texas, Australia. Get out, welcome to Texas, Australia. It's just This kind of breaks my heart a little bit. Who's, who's that mean? Uh, so it turns out there's a Texas Australia. I had no idea. Um, so I put that uh, sort of in the back of my mind thinking in terms of this presentation. It turns out it's in Queensland. Uh, and the more that I started digging into research that had been done on Queensland uh, and writers who came from there, I, I saw over and over people referring to Queensland as the Texas of Australia. Uh, so that definitely factored into uh, my studying at UQ. It all, I mean, things just have a way of working out sometimes, I suppose, but uh, it couldn't have been a better situation because ultimately when I got the Fulbright, I got to go to Texas, Australia, several times actually. I ended up um, doing, I guess, the equivalent of cold calling, and I just sent out emails, um, including to, to David Carter. David Carter was the first person I emailed at UQ because I, I did my research and I knew he specialized in print cultures between the US and Australia. Uh, and has a, a stellar publishing record and, uh, and standing over there. Uh, so he was the first person I reached out to and he immediately agreed to be my mentor when I was over there. And then I sent, uh, I found out Texas, Texas Queensland has 900 people there. So it's about the same size as the town that I grew up in, uh, but they have some like three or four museums. It's, it's strange. Uh, a lot of public memory work to do. There, so I emailed somebody at the uh, Texas Heritage Museum and said, "Hey, can I come be a research assistant?" And they emailed right back and said, "Yeah, absolutely." So I mean, the project really just fell into place. It was, it was really unbelievable. I don't, I don't, I couldn't, it couldn't have 
really, you know, been a better project, and especially because I do this stuff on settler literatures, but my dissertation includes music and art and all kinds of stuff, right? So, like, that's gonna be in the dissertation. As it turns out. <laughs> that's not an accurate representation of what music's like in Australia for the most part. But, uh, but there's, lots, there's lots of stuff to work with there. It's, it's super interesting. Um, so that's where I started, and then I ended up, uh, of course, you know, going elsewhere with it. But um, so that evolved into this this idea about contemporary settler literature, and that really came about by um, a couple of you know, again, just being at ASU, having great resources, right, and uh, meeting scholars, and it really, I mean, you know, we have wonderful resources here, but when you start studying a national literature that isn't necessarily one of the main areas of focus for a lot of folks here in the States, right? Like a, a lot of people don't read Australian literature necessarily, right? So when you start trying to do academic work there, it's a pretty narrow field. Um, and most of what you end up finding is Australian scholars who have made a name in the US, right? Um, so I read as much as I could uh, there. I got my hands on as many uh, Australian novels and, and that sort of thing as I could, but it's you're pretty limited still in what you can get, right? So I went, I, I got the Fulbright and I went over there with um, a pretty, what I thought was a pretty complete draft of a prospectus talking about these trends in Australian literature that I wanted to work with and these authors and all this stuff. And then I actually started working with Australian literature and realized like I didn't know anything, right? Uh, or just hardly anything. Um, so what I thought I would do is kind of give you the experience that I had, um, which was, you know, when I started this internship, it was really get to know the database. They did a major overhaul with the interface and the new landing page and everything while I was there. I, and it's a, I think they did a beautiful job. You can um, see if you scroll down, there's all kinds of just, I mean, the stuff that, you know, I have no idea how to do any of the, the programming and, and code and everything that goes into all this, but it's a beautiful website in addition to being uh, really functional. But I wanted to start, um, I suppose, with looking through some of the Blackboard stuff to give you an idea of how this archive is structured. So Blackboard, like I said, is really, it's unique. Um, even from the rest of the exhibitions that are on Auslit, it's built around, for the most part, this idea of trails. But also, it's always about teaching resources um, and then promotion of, of works uh, and events and all of that kind of stuff. One of the things that really stands out about Blackworks is that they have, uh, or Blackwords, is that they have a number of full text resources that are published on the website. That's true for other works as well, which I'll, I'll show you some of those in a bit. Um, but this is, like I said, probably the most um, wide, in, in terms of scope, the widest coverage of Australian Aboriginal work. Um, but the exhibition is mostly around these trails, right? And so you can see information trails. So they're themed for the most part, or, or they're divided down into uh, different subcontent areas. And it includes the different peoples from different parts of the countries, um, war stories, sports. Uh, David Dupont, and then so take a look at the Stolen Generations. The Stolen Generations, one of the reasons to do this kind of work um, is that there are so many parallels in the history and experiences of indigenous peoples in settler colonial states like the US and Australia, um, where we have narratives of uh, removal and boarding schools, they're the same narratives in Australia. They specifically referred to that generation as the stolen generations. Uh, one of the works that you might have encountered is Rabbit Proof Fence, right? And so that centers around the stolen generations. Uh, but there's a massive body of work. And it, the acknowledgement of the stolen generations has been one of the defining factors in how Australians think about colonial history and how they think about their relationship to settler literature and indigenous art. Um, they have a national sorry, sorry day. There's been a formal apology over there, which you know we, we haven't necessarily had on the same scale here. So people have been engaging with those kind of things. Settlers and Aboriginal artists have been engaging with the politics of reconciliation 
way more directly than we have over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, so you can see just the wealth of information that exists within each one of these trails, right? Like there's just, there's so much stuff. And there's video, there's links out to uh, works of note, artists of note. Um, so it's, it's this incredibly immersive way to encounter um, Australian literary culture in really in-depth and curated ways. Um, the people who, who work on these are all major scholars in the field. Whether they're at UQ or not, there's, there's a great network of scholars who have contributed uh, to the exhibitions that are here. So let me, some of the other resources, resources, the major things. So you can see the three, like the three main themes are teaching research and then your own exploration, mm -hmm. right? So one thing that's great about Oslit is that they've divided the information up um, between the different levels of education. And they, uh, one of the major subscribers to the service are public schools at the middle and uh, at high school, whatever the equivalent is there, right? So there's a good chance that if students enroll in literary classes at UQ, and they grew up in that area that they have probably encountered Oslit. So they'll come in with some kind of fluency, uh, hopefully, right? So they'll know how to use it. Because, I mean, there's a lot here, right? And, and you have to take some time, uh, just like any other database, getting to know how to do it. But, uh, but I love the way that it's divided up. So uh, moving from, from teaching to research, there are more of these exhibitions. That's really, to me, I think that's the cornerstone of this database. Now, of course, you can just go in, if you know the research you want to do, you know, there's a search function and you can just go, and the advanced search features, you can get as specific as you possibly want with that. But if it's, if it's sort of new and you're looking for avenues to pursue, to see what's been done uh, and, and what's happening now, you can check out these exhibitions on research. Uh, and, and the same goes for Explore. There's just, there is an amazing wealth of scholarship that's been done just through this uh, database alone. It's, it's really fascinating. One of the great things uh, about using this too, I didn't, I didn't pull this up or plan on talking about it, but I remembered it as I was getting ready. Uh, you can, so if you go and look for just an individual text, let's do, uh, let's do the search, bring up Patrick White. Patrick White, probably the most well-known um, Australian author, unless, you know, it's a contemporary Richard Flanagan. Well, I guess Keneally and Carey, David Maloof probably. But uh, one of the great things about this database is that they actually record how many units are teaching those particular works, so they can run the numbers and know what the most taught novel in Australia mm -hmm. is, right? Uh, in the at the university level. It turns out it's Kate Grimble's The Secret, Secret River, which has been a miniseries and a movie and is uh, a sort of a, a romantical or, or a romance history that's based in the author's family history and it's about colonization removal. Uh, it, it's the most widely read. It's probably the most widely criticize work too. Lots of problems in terms of uh, race and guilt and that sort of thing, right? Uh, that's al That always comes with the reconciliation politics in Australia when they talk about white writers post sorry talking about colonization. There's always this mediation of white guilt, right? So there's lots of that stuff going on. But I think that's a fascinating research, especially if you're, you're interested in uh, sort of tracking the trends of, of what other people are doing and, and focusing in on where it's happening, that sort of thing. So, this is the exhibit that I put together. Um, and uh, I think it ended up working out to my benefit that I didn't have any training in digital humanities before I went out completely unqualified to do it. Uh, <laughs> I had a Facebook at the time. I don't have it anymore. <laughs> it's, it's too much. <laughs> um, so there's sort of, a, there's sort of a, a format for how they put these exhibitions together over there, right? And of course, I just went in and said, ah, I'll make it up as I go, right? And, they, and Carrie and the rest of the team were amazing. They said, yeah, Texas. Of course, they called me Texas. Do that, and we'll help you out along the way, right? <laughs> and they did, and they took great care of me. 
Uh, so this thing started out uh, with a couple of rough ideas about what I wanted to do, and it just kept growing and kept growing. And it's um, it's great. It's, I mean, I think I hope that it's a helpful um, research guide. Uh, you can see it turned into this, it's a resource for students and teachers. And I was thinking about students at the college level because one of the great things about being over there uh, on this Fulbright was that my time was, was fairly unstructured and I got to audit a lot of classes and see how um, they teach these works over there. Uh, it's, a, it's a really different style of classroom engagement, right? They do the, the lecture and tutorial system over there. Uh, so I sat in on, on a couple of those and got to see how they engage with, with the colonial history and literature and then contemporary writers and indigenous writers and that sort of thing. So um, I think even though there is uh, more of a general awareness about um, indigenous activism uh, and that sort of thing going on with the average white Australian, they face a lot of the same problems that we do and not wanting to openly talk about race and, and that sort of racism and the problems that, that come along with that, right? Difficult conversations that they're not just, you know, even college age students don't wanna just jump right into having those conversations in class because it's, uh, it comes along with a lot of the same baggage that it does here. It's hard, it's intimidating, it's hard for them to talk about. So I thought, put together a resource that gives them a way into reading these works having conversations, and hopefully writing uh, term papers on it was, was one of the things that I had in mind. And then also for teachers uh, at the high school and college level who might want to implement some of this stuff into their curriculum, right? So part of this, you see down there at the bottom, it says Drover's Wife, a case study. That was actually um, included in that professional development day uh, thing, so I'll, I'll take you through that and show how uh, I set that up to be implemented into those classrooms. Uh, so this ends up uh, having these, you know, there's a bunch of sections just sort of explaining uh, how I came to this project. The landing page is, is mostly about setting up definitions, um, talking about where the field's at, where it's come from, um, highlighting some major figures you can see. And the great thing about it is that there are entries for these folks, Patrick Wolf, Lorenzo Veracini, Eileen Morton Robinson. Um, and so uh, you can link out to them. So I wanted to, I know this is already gonna be a long talk, but I had to do this. Uh, one of the reasons I got the full ride, I'm absolutely convinced, is because I met Patrick Wolf when he was here to give a talk with AIS. Um, Lee's partner actually managed to set me up to go have coffee with him. It was supposed to be Dr. Vega, myself, and Patrick. Last minute, Suhei couldn't make it, so they turned him loose with just a grad, like a fanboy grad student. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I definitely had a copy of his book in my backpack to sign it for me, right? But we ended up having this great conversation. Uh, incredibly warm, funny, um, just interested in the work I was doing and made me feel like it was important, right? And this is way before I even thought about applying for a Fulbright. Um, I was probably just still talking about Western novels at that point. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I know I was, because I had these little books that I got in a Happy Meal, uh, uh, a McDonald's Happy Meal called The Story of Texas, and I was so geeked up on them, I wanted to show them to him. And he loved them, he's flipping through them right there. There's just little chapbook sized things, that super racist history of Texas that McDonald's put out in Happy Meals in 1986. And I knew he would like it, right? And so he says, um, can I borrow these? And I went, no. <laughs> and I immediately was like, oh, no, yeah, yeah, of course you can. And he was so gracious about it. He's like, no, no, I shouldn't have asked. They're, you know, they're from your childhood. Whatever. And so uh, he signed my book. He's super nice. Just a wonderful person. Um, and definitely one of those people that, uh, you know, I put on a pedestal in terms of a scholar. He's so important to the field. He and Veracini especially in terms, in terms of formalizing settler colonial studies as a discipline. I mean, rock stars, right? And you get to meet those people that are nice to you and it's just the best thing in the world. He bought my coffee, so. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't let him borrow my books. So, uh, so, then, so then I applied for the Fulbright and I reached out to him and uh, I said, I'm, I'm gonna be applying for this and I, and I wondered if he'd write me a letter of recommendation. You know, he's a big name in the field and, and having him sign off on it would be great. And he said, yeah, uh, get right on it. 
We had a big storm here though, and I had some trees knocked down, and he sent me a picture of him like cutting dead wood trees up. Like, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just like, oh, this guy's my friend, I guess, I don't know. It's just <laughs> guy stuff, we're growing out now. And we had this correspondence back and forth, it was wonderful. I went home for the holidays, and, there, and I was in Fredericksburg, up in the hill country, and there's this little Texas bookshop that they specialize in Texana, and I found another set, an original set of that story of Texas. And uh, so I emailed it back and I said, I need your address. And then I boxed it up and I sent it to him. And uh, it takes a long time for mail to get delivered over there. In the interim, I get the Fulbright. I email him to tell him thank you. And he said, I knew it was, you know, I knew it was gonna work out. I believed in you 100% the entire time. I knew you were gonna get it. And I said, good, we'll, we'll keep your eyes peeled because there's something, there's a gift coming. And uh, I was actually on an email chain with my committee like a couple of weeks later. And one of them said, uh, here's, here's all your revisions you need to do. And by the way, did you know Pat Wolf died? And it was just like, what? You know, just crushed me. Uh, and so I just looked around, I did as much research as I could to try to find, and there, was, there were already some memorials going up. Um, this is so, I just, what, uh, like three months later, I got the package back in the mail, like, and it said on there, like, reason for return never claimed. And it was just like, God, you know, like I never, I got to say thanks in an email, but I didn't ever get to see him when I went over there, you know? Uh, so <laughs> it's just this small, like, I don't know, it's kind of silly. The first thing I did when I started my internship was I went and fleshed out Pat's page, you know, and added his picture and, the, you know, some of his works and that kind of stuff. Um, I ended up you can tell him in the tattoos. Uh, he always signed his emails at the end. He'd write these emails and then he'd sign it at the end, go well, right? And uh, I got that tattooed on the back of my arm when I was over there too, uh, in memory of him. It's, uh, so it's, it's one of those things, like it's, it's great. It's a publication. It's great because it's gonna help me write my dissertation. Uh, but there's really personal aspects involved with all of it as well. And I'm super glad I got to do that as a way like a tiny gesture of saying thank you, right? Okay, so, uh, d <laughs> and now this, I, so I tell you that, and now I gotta switch uh, tones on you. So then I talk about settler literature, uh, comparative settler literature sort of developing as its own discipline, and uh, I have to point out here, I did not uh, go in there and add you on there because I knew you were coming to the talk, Alex, but I gave you a shout out on there as one of the people who's like doing work in this emerging field, right? Um, so this email goes out and it's like, hey, come listen to Frank tell his dumb dumb stories for this Fulbright thing. <laughs> and I get an email from uh, this guy whose work I know and I've talked about on here and who I've seen at a conference, right? And he's like, hey, I work at ASU now. I'm like, well, how about that? <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, it's great to have Alex here too. He does amazing work. We actually uh, saw a panel he put together at ASA, uh, when Lee and I went up there in Denver. Um, so, yeah, so that's super cool to have somebody who does uh, really similar work to what I do in a very small field. Uh, <laughs> like, it's my competition back there, right? I mean, no, I mean, collaborator, <laughs> colleague, I don't know. <laughs> don't let him out of this room, you guys. Uh, so anyways, this is sort of like mapping out uh, how I envision the field of settler literature. And, and one of the things you keep in mind, all these definitions, all this stuff is just, it's, it's my own writing, my own thoughts based off of the research that I did over there. It's peer reviewed by David Carter and, and a couple other people. Um, but it's all you know, new content that I was generating. And, I, and, I'm, and, and in a lot of ways, making up as I was learning, right? So I'm teaching myself as I'm building this resource for teaching uh, other people how to teach their own national literature, right? Like, of course, the, like quintessential white guy colonizer. Let me show up <laughs> teach you. Here's how you, let me mansplain your whole history to you, right? Um, so I, I had this idea that I wanted to put several uh, features, unique features in here at, to make this a resource. And that started with a bibliography. Um, and you can see that I've got it divided up into different genres. Um, and what I'm, I'm really proud of this because this, to me, this was like putting together a comps list, which is one of like, to me, it's like super painful, but also really enjoyable in a nerdy way, right? Because you get to list all your, you get to make a reading list basically, and then just go binge read. 
So everything that's on here, um, I read while I was over there. I made this pact with myself early on. You're not going to put it on the bibliography unless you've read it and you write the blurb about it, however long it's going to be, but you're going to be the one to do it. Uh, and if anybody else were to go look at this page, they wouldn't see my uh, to-do list down here, but because I'm logged in, y'all are <laughs> works that need to be added. So it's all this stuff. So it's a reminder, like, you know, it's a work in process. But if anybody else goes and looks at it, they won't see it. Um, but it's... It's, uh, it's one of those things, as like a first-generation scholar, I think a lot of us uh, who go through this kind of work struggle with that imposter syndrome and think, um, I know when I was over there, the Fulbright feels like such, uh, I mean, it's an honor and it's prestigious. And, and they tell you you're a cultural ambassador, you know, like go over there and spread goodwill right after Trump's elected. Like, go represent, <laughs> go, go represent your country well. And it's like, the bar's low. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and I did. And I did. And I did. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I know there were several times when I was over there where I had this thought, like, uh, somebody else should be doing this work, you know? I'm, I'm taking advantage of it. I'm not working as hard as I should. Um, there are any number of more deserving people who could have come over here and done this. There are indigenous students who should be doing this kind of work. And I'm over here, uh, you know, whatever. So it's, it's nice. I went back and looked at this today, and if nothing else, I can say, like, man, I've, I've read a lot. Now, could I have done that here? Uh, maybe. <laughs> But, but no, actually, because I didn't know most, and this is uh, embarrassing to say, I didn't know a lot of these works existed until I got over there and actually used the database and talked to people. I said, this is the work I do. And they made recommendations. You've got to read this, right? And a lot of them, uh, I only had access to through the um, special collections in the, the library there at UQ. So a lot of this stuff, uh, you're not going to find on a bookshelf, on a used bookstore. Uh, you're gonna have to special order it. It's gonna be super expensive, right? So um, I needed to be there to do this work in lots of ways, right? Uh, so there's that. So it just just blurbs on on the different things. They're not necessarily connected in any way other than genre, but um, just sort of mapping out what's out there and what might fit under this big umbrella of settler literature. The other thing that I think is really cool and helped me probably more than anything was I made this timeline. Um, that, so one of the questions that kept coming up was how are you going to define contemporary? Because it's contemporary settler literature. How do you define contemporary? Define contemporary? And so um, I made this slideshow that puts uh, the, several of these works in uh, chronological context with major events that are happening in um, policy and of Aboriginal culture and settler culture, right? So uh, it's just a timeline. And honestly, it's it's like the Native Title Act is a massive pivot point in Australian literature. Um, but I don't know necessarily, you know, I had read Maloof's Remembering Babylon, and it's a great book, uh, it's, and tons of people have written about it. But the fact that it happens prior to Native Title is gonna shape the way that you end up writing about it, right? I don't know, I mean, I probably would have caught that somewhere or I would have gotten embarrassed at a conference somewhere and somebody pointed that out, right? Like, um, so this was this was really helpful. And again, it's just, it's such a small selection though and you end up playing gatekeeper and saying who gets in and gets out. But um, I tried to do justice to different genres and writers of different backgrounds and particularly how I thought they fit with these historical events. Um, and then the other thing I did is I put together this glossary, and again, the same thing. It's just, you know, these critical terms that I encountered, uh, especially in reading the, um, the secondary works, things that you just see popping up, big ideas that I thought people might need to know. Um, and it's the same policy. I didn't put it on there unless I felt like I had a really good working definition of it. And I should note, too, that I defended my prospectus via Skype while I was over there, which I don't recommend. Uh, but I was def you can tell I was definitely in prospectus mode, like thinking, like <laughs> defense mode, right? Like them being like, what do you mean by this term? 
and I can be, you know, have the laptop pulled up over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what I mean is, this is a concept coined by. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it didn't come to that. Uh, so yeah, just and it's not comprehensive. It's not complete, uh, but it's a good starting point, I think. And and was one of those things that really helps me. Uh, another unit on themes and motifs, and this is where I was really thinking about how do we build this out into curricular for teachers or give recommendations for students on where they could take term papers. Uh, and selfishly, it, it also is sort of like this repository for me when I had ideas like, oh, here's this is something you should think about writing about eventually, right? Like this massive, you know, uh, PhD nerd, you get these great, I'm gonna write this article and this book, and, and it's just these massive ideas, and you've constantly got Bebo telling you, write the dissertation, right? <laughs> but, uh, so there's a little bit of forecasting. So the way that I set it up was, there's a central theme, and then talk about the major um, Australian works that, and, and authors that we might talk about first, and then pair that with Australian scholarship, specifically uh, Aboriginal scholarship responding to those themes, right? But then, because I am who I am and I do the works that I do, I wanted to bring in U.S. correlations to those things. So I offer um, uh, examples, creative examples from the U.S. and indigenous scholarship that they could pair that with. Not always indigenous, but scholarship that, that is settler colonial theory that would pair with that. So, uh, and it's, it's really simple themes, right? Captivity, well, not simple, but, you know, vaguely defined, belonging. Uh, so offer a definition and then give critical works and then start moving towards this comparative emphasis on thinking outside of national boundaries and how these works can be put in conversation with works from the US because that's my specialty, right? Uh, so frontier violence, all that kind of stuff. And then these link back to the original um, entries that were added, you know, in some cases way before I ever got there. So that leads to this, which is basically me just waxing poetic about why you should do the kind of work uh, that I do, I guess. Again, I was in uh, dissertation mode, or prospectus mode big time here, so uh, don't tell anybody when I copy pasted this directly out of my prospectus. <laughs> <laughs> I made a few changes, like I linked, hey. Uh, but then it was, it's, I thought it was a good opportunity to show off other scholars and, and the work that they're doing. Uh, both from the U.S. looking out to Australia, and then in reverse, the Australian scholars who are thinking about and writing about um, comparative literatures. Uh, and this is this comes from the first uh, the first American Indian literature course I ever took with Drew back at Sam Houston. We read uh, Thomas King's The Truth About Stories, and I always remember there's this little passage in there where he talks about he's Cherokee and he talks about uh, going to New Zealand. In Australia, and this is the the lecture version here, where he's got this great resonant voice and amazing uh, humor and timing, um, and it's where the uh, you've probably heard it, this catchphrase, I guess, uh, that's always associated with him. You're not the Indian that I had in mind, right? He outlasted his uh, immigration visa. That was three months. I think he stayed for a year and a half, and he calls the consulate, and uh, they said. Uh, well, let's work on getting you a visa. Where are you from? Or, or what's your, uh, what did they say? What's your ethnicity? Something. They worded it strangely, and he said Indian. And they said, oh, no, we don't issue. Um, we have too many Indians coming over here. We're not issuing any more visas. And he thought, like, how many? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, well, where are they coming from? And he said, oh, mostly Bombay. And he said, no, no, I'm not. Uh, that's, I meant Native American. And the guy said, oh, you're not the Indian I had in mind, right? And so that's just, mm. and that happened in Australia, right? So uh, anytime you can work Thomas King into your work, I think you should. Okay, this is, uh, this is the last thing I'll talk about, the thing that I'm probably the most proud of, because it was this last, sort of this, my project was wrapping up. And keep in mind, while I was putting all this together, I was also doing field work out in Texas, right, and doing a research project there. I traveled uh, a bit, went to conferences and presentations and all that kind of stuff. Um, had a weird relationship in the middle of all that. Like, had an actual life while I was there. Went to concerts, you know, got up to no good. Uh, <laughs> and then right at the end, I was thinking, yeah, I'm wrapping this up. Uh, we'll be heading home pretty soon. Uh, 
Carrie says, we've got this, we, we've got this, body, of, this like, body of text around Henry Lawson. And I, at first, it's like, you know, the drover's wife comes out in 1892, and I'm like, oh, well, I do contemporary work, you know, I don't want to, <laughs> right? Um, but Lawson, like Banjo Patterson, is one of those figures, if you're going to study settler literature or Australian literature, however you're going to define it, you can't get around it. You have to engage with it, right? And I realized um, that it was a good opportunity, and I really, it was another chance for me to sort of branch out in this unexpected way, particularly because most of these works, The Drover's Wife is a short story, uh, and it's, I don't know, it's on the level of, I mean, it's a short story, so it's not the perfect comparison, but it's on the level of, like, Huck Finn. It's, everyone reads it, right? It's foundational. Uh, but it's problematic in, in lots of, the title, right? The Drover's Wife. The Drover's never in the story. He's always absent, <laughs> right? She's never named, and there's all kinds of problems. Uh, it's, it's your basic, not Southern Gothic, but I guess Australian Bush Gothic. Um, vulnerable woman, isolated house, looming threat. It's a black snake. You can imagine mm -hmm. what that is. It's 1892, give him some credit, right? <laughs> uh, his racism was only developed so far. So uh, that's the sort of starting point. And, it, and Carrie said, we've got these plays that are written by white Australian women that, re that I think respond to Lawson. Do you want to, and we're going to publish them. <clears throat> They're out of copyright, so we're going to publish them through Austin. Do you want to do something with it? So, absolutely. I'll take a look. Most of them are one act plays, um, really quick reads. So, uh, all I intended to do was talk about The Drover's Wife and then stop with Betty Rowland's morning and do these five sort of dramatic responses by Australian women. Um, and you can see, I got a little carried away there. Uh, so each one of these entries sort of follows the same pattern, right? So you get the author, the title, the date, and then every one of them has a corresponding image or two that I pulled out of the National Library. We've got this amazing resource of uh, public domain pictures, and, and, and I typed like um, uh, slap house and dog, because those are two really important features of that story. And lo and behold, there's pictures of slap houses with dogs <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a mother and the children, and there's no drover inside. So corresponding image, um, my sort of synopsis, and then I pulled out what I thought were major quotes that were really important for a work like uh, Lawson's that's pretty big, multiple image, multiple quotes, right? And then, uh, because I have to spread my own propaganda, the whole time I'm reading them, I'm thinking, man, we should really be making connections back to American literature. There's so much in common here, right? So I put in these comparison units for each one of them. And these uh, frontier stories of Lawson's reminded me so much of Kate Chopin yeah. for so many reasons, but it's a completely, it's a very different perspective, right? So the endangered woman home alone, it, like the storm immediately pops into my head, but thinking how different the rendering of, of femininity and violence and all those things are, right? There's a massive storm in both of them, but they're, they mean very different things, right? Uh, so, so putting, again, that emphasis on doing this comparative work outside of maybe just uh, a narrow window of Australian literature. So this starts with the plays that respond back, and again, corresponding image. I had a lot of fun digging through the, um, the archives just for images, right? Spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, the dogs preventing, like, that actually is in the story, or in the play, right? That plays a big part of these dogs chasing the convicts. And it, it's great. I mean, these are minor works, sometimes by major writers. Pritchard, Pritchard is a major writer. Lawson, of course, is a major writer. Um, but not necessarily what I would call major works, they're one-act plays. Um, so it's, it's a way sort of of seeing a development through Australia's national literature, right? It gives you this trail that you can follow through, this thread you can follow through, um, and seeing how there's this shift, right? Uh, it, it ends up, that narrative, in responding to the original narrative, this new wrinkle gets added in about removing the convict stain, right? And that becomes a, a major part of the national identity. Um, mm. But it's also something you can link to indigenous politics. I found this, this protest button 
uh, centering around, so 1788 is generally held as uh, the date of the, uh, the beginning of colonization, right? So huge celebrations and protests in 1988, and this slogan, white Australia has a black history, becomes, I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. It's painted on a mural on UQ's campus, right? It's just mm-hmm. everywhere. And it's, for me, it's, this particular image is so fascinating because it's, so it's the Aboriginal flag in the back, right? Um, it's the uh, insistence that we acknowledge colonial violence, but then it's also, I mean, there's this major shift in being ashamed of the convict history and then really embracing it, right? Becoming the battlers. Um, and had it, or like the larrikin spirit, like having that bit of a, being a bit dodgy or a bit cheeky or having a bit of a sordid background actually becomes a positive, right? But this riffing on that, breaking the convict chains, right? It's just, to me, it's super powerful and, and it's something that I would hope uh, would speak to kids who are maybe not interested in plays from the late 19th century necessarily, but they can find a way, right, to work it in. Uh, this is a drought on the actual river that talk, they talk about. I'm telling you, man, just the things I was able to find in there, the picture resources are amazing, including these two lovebirds. Uh, and then, this is gonna sound like super left field, but this play from the 1920s is uh, one of the things that, and it's a, it's a small detail, but uh, because Lawson's story talks so much about a dog and a snake as central character, I mean, they're really important to the text, right? I started thinking about uh, the role that animals play throughout all of this, these works. Uh, this one just happens to have, which one is it? Uh, the drought, a horse dies, and that's like the final straw between this husband and wife. Um, and they have these, the husband has this psychotic break because the horse died, and they love that horse, and it's, it's symbolic of them moving out there, building this house, right? Like making their stand, uh, trying to make a go of it. And uh, because I grew up in Texas country music, Bruce Robinson, my favorite songwriter of all time, he has a song about this guy broken down. He has a horse named LaRose that he's trying to sell, and he, he's selling it for $50, the first person he runs into. And the next verse, he's lowered it to 25. Mm-hmm. And the next verse, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll take five. I've already sold the saddle, I got no use. But as he's doing that, he's telling, he's trying to make sales pitches, and it ends up being about how this horse uh, dragged the logs that helped him build the cabin. It was, he's gentle, says he's the only horse that my little girl ever would ride. No sir, she caught the fever and she died. So it's this really, you know, sentimental rendering of, of basically a horse in colonization. I don't know. I thought it would be something that the kids would want to listen to. The more people, the more people who listen to Bruce Robinson, the better. Uh, Josh Oliver just looks a lot like me. Got an amazing voice. <laughs> no, that's not true. No, that's not true. This is it's the same thing. This is about uh, settlers moving in to Texas um, and having a really hard go of it. Um, and I love. It's a haunting song. It's beautiful. It's made even better by Oliver's voice. Um, but there's this line in it, right? They're, they face all these natural hardships. I put that in sarcastic quotes on there. He says, uh, there's bears in the woods and there's wolves and there's engines, right? And it's just this quick little thing and then it moves on to something else. The song's not about indigeneity at all, but it's just that detail, you know, tucked in there as one of these natural threats to colonization um, that, that I would want to impress upon them. anybody who I was working with with these texts is that, uh, you know, something I... I the, the resistance that I do get in working with students sometimes is they'll say, you're just, you're reading into the text, you're reading in too much. You're, you're really forcing this whole indigenous thing. And, uh, and, and we're not, you know, we're not. And, and the erasure is actually, is part of what we talk about, even if it's, you know, if it's lines like that. Um, so I thought, bring music into it. Um, because the story, you know, this settler literature is not, just novels and poetry. It's the songs that were brought over and adapted and written. More plays, same thing, huge gold nugget. Uh, Johnny Cash singing about Ned Kelly, which I figured would just be great. Uh, Really famous painting by Russell Drysdale, which is his take on the drover's wife. Um, So this is where I started finding out like, oh, there's this really interesting uh, arc to this because in the 70s, there's this shift. It's not to say that white women stop writing 
in response to Lawson, but black theater really takes off in the 70s uh, with Jerry Bostock and this play in particular. Um, which you can tell, there, obviously, there's uh, connections between the US and Australia to do right there, right? That's the original playbill. So good on Jerry Bostock for just going all out and uh, grabbing people's attention. But one thing I realized in trying to find this text to read and quote, the whole thing's never been published anywhere before. It's been published in pieces. Mm. So acts have been published. It's a five act play. Uh, the whole thing's never been in print. It's been performed several times, never been in print. Uh, and Oslit is the type of organization with the type of connections uh, he's, he's passed on, unfortunately. But there are connections in place where this play can potentially be published for the first time through an outlet like Oslit, right? And, and I think would be a major contribution to uh, not just Australian drama, but particularly black theater. Um, because it's so political, right? And it, and it addresses, like Jack Davis, who's surely the most well-known Aboriginal dramatist in Australia. Um, but Jerry Bostock's right there at the beginning, too. Um, so I was really happy with finding that uh, and being able to include it. Um, Andrew Bovels, this is, so uh, Bovel is a, uh, he's a, he's um, not native. He is Australian. Uh, he's got this play, Holy Day, that comes out in 2001. And this is where, I mean, so this is post-apology, right? So uh, this much more critical looking back, and it's the same tropes. It's uh, a mother and daughter who run, they call it the Traveler's Rest, this inn out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the threat turns out to be these really uh, seedy, they're, they're not convicts necessarily, well, they, they actually are, to a little more. Um, but it's much more complicated than the rendering we get in um, Lawson's story, for example. So it turns out that this mother-daughter combo that's running the inn, uh, it's, they're not just providing a place to sleep and food to eat, you can fill in the blanks, uh, but it turns out the daughter is a member of the Stolen Generations, mm -hmm. and this mother who's ultra-protective of her daughter to the way that she puts, to the extent that she puts herself in the way of sexual violence um, to protect her daughter. It's not, she's not her daughter at all, mm -hmm. right? She's, she stole the child, she's a part of the stolen generations. So it adds all of these uh, complex racial issues that are missing, and, and even though Lawson has blackness and even an Aboriginal character not confronting that history uh, whatsoever. It is an absolutely brutal play. It's, uh, I would put it on the level of uh, reading Blood Meridian, probably. Like you need to go take a bath afterwards to get, you know, wash it off of you because it is absolutely brutal. But I found out that a couple of years ago there was this major controversy in uh, UIL in Texas because these uh, private school in Houston, these kids did a production of it. Uh, and parents were outraged because there's public nudity, there's rape, there's very violent rape. Um, in addition to all kinds of other violence, it's tough language. I think somebody urinates at one point. I mean, it's pretty, pretty. Uh, it pushes the edge, right? It, especially for high school. So parents were outraged. It won, uh, it won the top award that year, best production, right? And, and it's, you know, it's Texas. So this weird little looping back to my own thing. Uh, but lest we think that Everybody is super progressive and, uh, and, and in able to engage with uh, these new politics. I present to you Luke O'Shea and his song, The Drover's Wife, which talks about the story and the impact that it had on his childhood, and then talks about how his life as a troubadour keeps him away from his wife and children back home and how much he misses them. Like, I mean, right? <laughs> uh, but. <laughs> It won the Country Music Australia Awards Heritage Song of the Year. Uh, wow. And this guy has made a career off of that. He was a public school teacher, right? And this guy has won that award like three or four times. So he writes, so he found his niche in Australian country music. And it's writing these, uh, these songs that really romance that settler history mm -hmm. and sort of like bring it into this contemporary setting, right? Um, so still work to be done. That all, it comes to an end with Leah Purcell's production of The Drover's Wife, 
last year. Lee Purcell, uh, very well-known actress in Australia, she's Aboriginal, she's also a playwright. Um, so she's Aboriginal, uh, has, I think, Irish uh, ancestry as well that she acknowledges and has uh, used in her work, including this one. Um, and her iteration of The Drover's Wife picks up after Lawson's, and it fills in a bunch of blanks, right? Uh, for one, it names The Drover's Wife. Uh, we find out why he's gone. He, it turns out, I won't spoil it for you, but he hasn't gone a droving. Like, <laughs> there's, a, there's a bit of a hump in the wood pile. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, he's dead. <laughs> sorry, sorry, right away. Um, but it's just, it's like, um, you have this really, s this small, rich thing in Lawson, right? And then Purcell comes along and opens it up and fills in the rest. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful play. It's not easy, again, right? Colonial history, there's a lynching. It's, but it, it also tells her grandfather's story. He had this amazing story. Uh, travels all over the country in the circus, an Aboriginal man. Um, travels all over, the, all over the continent, and he's trying to get back to country at the end. She works him in there. Um, and that racial complexity that's in Bovel's play, Holy Day, is in here as well. Uh, the idea of mixed race passing, that sort of thing, shows up in a major way at the end of this play. But there's this beautiful touch. Uh, this, the woman, Molly, from, from Purcell's version, uh, talks about being raised on the outskirts of town by her, her father, who, who's white, and Molly is who we assume she's not. Uh, and her mother's out of the picture. Um, and she thinks that her mother died in childbirth, which is not the case. Uh, her mother's black. She never knows. Molly's really light complexed But her father is sort of uh, permanently melancholy about having lost his wife. And he sings this traditional song, black is the color of my true love's hair. So those lyrics are worked into the play all the time, right? It's this morning of having lost his wife. And so that song repeats all the time in this play. Um, and it's, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, but her hair's black because she's indigenous, it turns out, right? I mean, it's just this great, complex, layered story that pulls so many strands of Australian literary history together. Uh, she's, done a, she's done a lot of stuff with um, high school uh, drama departments. Uh, there's little clips. I really, I wanted to really feature this work because I think it's, it's so fantastic. And right while I was putting this together, Frank Morehouse scooped me and put out a book called The Drover's Wife that brings all of these other stories wow. together. So there's this whole history of people responding to The Drover's Wife that doesn't mention any of the works that I've just told you about, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who have written stories called The Drover's Wife in response to it, and they're satires wow. where they try to fill in the details that he left out. There's all kinds of artwork, and you can tell the subtitle, right? A celebration of a great Australian love affair. And it's mostly more, and Morehouse himself has a story called The Drover's Wife. It's part biography about Lawson, who is a fascinating character, really troubled in lots of ways. One of the all-time great mustaches, probably, as mustaches, you know. Uh, but there's, there's more to him than that. There's more to him than the stories he produced. The relationship he had with his mother, uh, who was a leading feminist at the time, is really, really fascinating, just so complex. But it's Morehouse telling Lawson's story and then using that to tell his own story and then bringing in all of these other um, short stories, poems, artwork that's been uh, produced in response to Lawson. So my initial reaction was like, oh, no, you know? Um, but then I realized that like, we're telling different stories yeah. off of Lawson, right? It, which I think, I mean, the only text that we have in common other than the, the original story is that painting, right? Because yeah. he talks about that. Um, so I, I just thought that was, was really fascinating. And then, I, and then I took some of these, like I said, I had a lot of fun with the images. Um, so I put in some more of those, uh, more images for context, but then also some, if this is gonna be uh, built out in the curricula, some things to talk about, just some talking points. Aboriginal threat to white womanhood, and why that would be a significant thing. And then referencing out to, to Larissa Burns' amazing work on, on um, Eliza Fraser, uh, and then giving some discussion prompts, and then, the, man, the references to Christianity are just so in your face. 
uh, that I had to put some stuff in there too. Just thinking about teachers and how to get a conversation. Going about those sort of things. So um, that's that, that's the entire project, and, and thanks for sitting through all that. I know that's a lot. Uh, I had a, I had an amazing time doing this, and and being over in Australia working with the Oslo team. It was, uh, 10 months was a long time. And, uh, and I talked about that insecurity about feeling like you should have done something more. And it was funny, I, <laughs> I had a, a bit of a panic when I realized that y'all were gonna see my to-do list at the bottom of that whole thing. <laughs> like you were gonna see that bibliography and, and be like, you didn't get to those other two. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was like, oh no, right? So I look at this and I realize it's a work in progress. Right. There's only four of those themes. And not that the world needs me to add more, but it's, you know, <clears throat> get that good Baptist upbringing from Waco, to get the guilt to get to do more, right? Uh, but it's also really nice to be able to look at this and acknowledge like a lot of work went into this and how much, um, how much help I got along the way. And to see the really personal parts of my experience and my background, uh, to be able to fold that into this research and to create this document that's gonna hopefully be used in Australia that has my weird stuff in it. But like people are gonna to listen to Bruce Robson, maybe, right? That's amazing. It makes me feel really good. And and I told you having that thing about Pat in there. Um, so yeah, I see myself in there, my background, my interests. I see my friends. Carrie Kilner is all over the place in this. Um, and Patrick, of course, I see some of my biggest influences and inspirations. Eileen Morton Robinson is a major, major um, force, I think is the right word, in Australian uh, scholarship. And I got to meet her at a conference. Um, and so she's, she's in there. Um, and while I can look at this and see that there's a lot of work to do, I, I know that there's a lot that's gone into it. And I feel like the Fulbright and Oslit um, helped me to make a contribution to something that I really deeply care about. An idea that's been evolving for several years that started out with a dumb idea about Westerns. Right? Like, it turned into this so far. And it, uh, it makes me hope that it will go further. You know? So my, my hope is that, uh, that this kind of work will inspire other people to join us in doing the work that we're doing and paying attention to these literatures because there's so much out there that is such high quality. Um, and we need to read those writers here as much as they need to read them back there. Thank you all very much.